Hi everyone, I'm uh, Chetan Khatri from India, Bangalore. Uh, I will be speaking on scaling tables of data with Apache Spark and Scala TSL production. Uh, so, how many of you knows Apache Spark, Scala? So, who am I? I am lead of data science, big data, and technology evangelist at Axion Labs, India. And I'm committer of Apache Spark, HBase, and Elixir language. I co-authored the curricula in um, Kutch University for IoT, big data, uh, ML, and AI. And previously I worked with uh, Excel and Nazara Games. So, Today we'll speak about Apache Spark and Scala. We'll talk about uh, RDDs and data frames, data set APIs, and Spark operation, data platform components, and uh, re-engineering data processing platform with the case study. We'll rethink about fast data architecture, what are the components, and how you can tune the Spark jobs. And uh, we'll talk about parallelism and concurrency with uh, Spark. For those who don't know what is Spark, so Spark is a fast general purpose clustering uh, computing system and a unified engine for processing the data. It provides high level API for Scala, Java, Python, and uh, it supports the general execution graph. It has the different component and framework for different uh, data processing. You can use the uh, structured data for Spark SQL. Machine learning for MLLab and graph processing GraphLab. Uh, they have streaming, Spark streaming, and structure streaming. Those who don't know what is Scala, so Scala is a functional programming language. It is also support the functional paradigm plus it supports the object-oriented paradigm. It is strongly type and type inference, and it supports higher-order functions. It has the Empower of the lazy computation um, framework. Data structure in Apache Spark, uh, you will have uh, RDD data frame and data set from Spark 2.x and 2.3. So, RDD is the abstract uh, data structure in Apache Spark, uh, which if you have the data set and when you distribute to the entire Hadoop cluster, it will partition and uh, it will be distributed and suffer to different executors and the cores. So when I talk about executors, it is the different node and uh, when I talk about driver, the where Spark context start and the driver which, which uh, is the master node and worker as the uh, executor nodes. So RDD will get splitted and distributed across the different nodes. and. Uh, you will have a distributed uh, file system like uh, ADFS or S3 bucket. RDD's characteristics is uh, immutable and resilient. When I talk about resilient, means uh, when in Spark supports two things, operations. One is transformation and other is action. So when you have the RDD and uh, one RDD, you apply the transformation, you again get another RDD, again you apply transformation. Assume that something went wrong and your transformation got failed. You have ability to recreate the RDD that you had earlier and that original RDD will be immutable without changing and uh, providing any um, transformation. RDD is a compile type safe and strongly type inference. So uh, in RDD you will have the type inference. So when you create the function, function will take argument as a function or the value. So when one function is taking the argument as an integer and if you pass the string, it will catch on the spot. So what happens is a runtime and compile time errors. If you have like 7 TB of data, you create the Spark job and then you are executing Spark job distributed workload. And as you know, debugging in a distributed computing is a cumbersome. Okay. If you run your workload, that takes 10 hours, and after 10 hours, if you get to know, there's a type issue, and that's why your Spark job got failed. So, RDD provides the type safety and strong type inference. 
uh, lazy evolution. So here, lazy doesn't mean the way uh, human being is lazy, but uh, it's not so forth. But it provides the uh, so when you when you create the RDD and provide the transformation like map or filter or uh, flat map. It creates the lineage, I mean, directed acyclic graph in, in the system, and uh, until you apply the action, like uh, reduce by key or so or tag, before that it will not execute entire graph. So uh, you apply the every time transformation, it will update the directed acyclic graph, and when you apply the action, from that time it will uh, execute your entire graph. So Spark has a two type of operation. One is transformation, other is action. Um, see, this is all about Spark operations and uh, transformation uh, and the actions. It supports the general uh, tra uh, transformations like map filter, flat map, uh, map partitions, and mathematical like uh, sample split of the random set theory like uh, union intersection, subtract, and listing, Cartesian, zip. Data structure, you will have a repartition and collapse. We'll talk about uh, in detail. Actions, it supports uh, all like count, reduce, collect, and save as file. So we'll talk about when to use RDD. When you, when you don't care about lots of lambda function than DSL. That does mean uh, you don't care that which lambda function you need to apply on which data set or you don't care about control on data set. You don't feel the flexibility on the data set. At that time, you can use the RDD. Or you don't care about the schema or structure of the data. So when you have a data set, you will have the structure of the data. Or you don't care about optimization performance or efficiencies that RDD can create. It's a very slow on non-JVM language like uh, Python or R. So what happens, uh, apart this Spark has been created with the Scala. And when you, it supports the different APIs with Spark uh, Python. So when you perform any action or transformation on Spark, it will pickle and depickle and send back to the JVM collections. And then it will get the same operation again. So when you don't care about slow performance, you use the RDD. Or don't care about in advanced inefficiencies. That does mean um, maybe you think uh, unwillingly unknowingly um, that you don't want to apply the transformation. For example, uh, you can see this uh, basic pseudocode here. Uh, if you can see the third line, reduced by key and the filter. So ideally, this is wrong here, because first you apply the filter. As slow as you get data to this part, reduced by key will do the massive suffering on entire cluster and that will uh, provide efficiencies and not optimization. So actually you should reverse the line number four and then line number three. So what will happen, uh, you apply the filter first and uh, then you apply the, your action. So what will happen, you, you are reading the latest data on your uh, cluster and then you are applying the uh, action on top of that. So then we talk about structured uh, in Spark. So what's uh, structured uh, API Spark does provide? So Spark provides you the uh, data frame, data set APIs. So why we use the data set? Because data set is a strongly typing ability to use the powerful lambda function. So when I talk about powerful lambda function, that does mean uh, Anonymous function that takes argument as a function uh, returns you the function, okay? And uh, Spark SQL optimized with execution engine like Catalyst and Tungsten. So what will happen that when you perform so Spark SQL and Spark uh, Data Frame has a, both are equal in terms of faster performance. The performance speed is equal, but the thing is like that when you provide the SQL as a string to the uh, spark.sql, it will execute. But if you have the uh, like typo, like you, when you say select, you have s double e l e t, and uh, at that time this is typo, but this will execute and it provides the error runtime. 
So you, you will not be able to catch that error as a compile time. So it is very cumbersome when you run the workload of like 10, G, 10 TB and you execute this and went home and when you come back you see the, it, it got failed because of this typo. So data set is a, a strongly typing. It, it will show you the error on compile time. Data set can be constructed from JVM object and uh, it uses the functional transformation like map, filter and flat map. A data frame is a data set organized into named columns. So data set, um, data frame is the alias of data set of row. And row is the JVM object that has the columns. So we'll compare that uh, when you when you have SQL, Spark SQL, when you have the data frame and data sets, and how it how it uh, compare each other. So so when you use the Spark SQL, compile time syntax error, I mean syntax error will be runtime. Also analysis error will be runtime. Data frame provides the syntax error compile time, but analysis error or runtime. If, when I talk about syntax error, so uh, and the analysis error, you are querying some table, which table is, doesn't exist. You are trying to query the view, which is not there in a Spark context or you are trying to read some of the columns or so applying some of the transformation on top of the some of the columns which is not there. So data sets, your syntax error and your analysis error will be compiled time. So think if you are coding in a Spark job, if it provides the compile time and the I mean syntax error on compile time, you, you know what's happening, right? You don't have to wait and execute the job. So analysis error are caught before a job runs on the cluster. So it saves the massive amount of time for you. So when I talk about uh, data frame and data set from 2016 in Spark 2.0, uh, you will have uh, you, you will have uh, two things: untype and type APIs. If you use a data frame, is the alias of the data set of row, which is untyped. If you use the typed API, it's a data set of the any uh, generic. So think in this example, we'll have a data frame API code. So this is same as we used with the RDD. Uh, so we have a past data frame, which is data, I mean RDD is the unstructured. And if you want uh, to make it structured, uh, you need to convert RDD to data frame. So here you say past RDD dot 2DF and you say project, sprint, and number of stories. And then you can apply any uh, transformation like filter. You say project is equal to finance, and then you say group by an aggregation of the sum and call the function count, and you say limit 100 and so 100. So what will happen here, this will provide you the, I mean strongly type, plus you will have the, here, you will have ability to call same thing that you do with the Spark SQL in this. This is same as same transformation. We are trying to first create the view. View will have the virtual table inside the Spark, and then you can apply the Spark transformation. And uh, so, if you execute this code, what will happen if you have a typo as this query select like that? It will give you runtime error. So you can save your amount of time. And those who are working with Spark, they know you need to work sometime at night because of your workload is working, this problem. You need to stay like, watch the Spark jobs and go to the yarn and check the all logs, what's happening. You refresh it, you say uh, the plan of uh, Exxon, then you provide all tasks got executed. It says out of memory error sometime. I mean, you understand the pain, you know? So why we need structured API that data frame, SQL, and RDD? The same as you can apply with data frame and SQL and RDD. So Spark has a abstract syntax tree when you provide the SQL uh, data frame and data set. So first, whatever you use, you use the data set or data frame or uh, Spark SQL, it will generate first on this all uh, plan of uh, action and then it will create the logical plan. When I talk about logical plan, it will check the column names and the table name, whether it exists or not. And then it will create the optimized 
logical plan, then it will create the multiple physical plan with the cost model. So cost model will give you statistical understanding that if you apply, if you execute this acyclic uh, graph, how much time it will take, and then it will choose the best cost model and select the physical plan and create the RDD. Now again, you will come back to RDD. So this RDD is, is not the same RDD. This is highly efficient, high level APIs of the RDD. And so RDD is not gone with about Spark. RDD is still there. And this RDD is the um, highly efficient optimized code. You understand as it is the uh, Java beans it is. And uh, because Spark runs on JVM and strongly type RDDs. So difference between that RDD that you see at the last and which we talked earlier, earlier is the lower level API and this is high level API. So data set API in uh, Apache Spark 2.x. Um, see this basic example, uh, we are trying to read the JSON file, spark.read.json and then we say uh, convert data to domain objects. You are trying to map a JSON structure with the case class. So case class, those who don't know in Scala, is like POJO in Java, which you map the structure of JSON with the structure of the case class. So you can do uh, masterling and unmasterling with the case class to JSON and JSON to case class. And you provide here employee name string and age integer. So now we are saying employee data set, data set of employee equal to employee's data frame as employees. So it will try to map your case class with the structure of JSON. So now when you see the line number four, filter data set, employee's data set dot filter, p is equal to p dot h. So you can read as a like Java object, p dot h. And when you say greater than three, if you if you will say integer, right now integer three, if you apply the any string, it will cache the compile time. You don't have to wait at the runtime and execute the job. If you're using the Intel J or like that, it will throw the error on the compile time. This is wrong, right? So data set API saves your time. Some people, I mean, obviously Spark, developers think sometimes um, why can't I just use the SQL string as I create with the Apache Spark and execute the same thing but it takes a lot of time you can save the time but if, when you use the strongly type um, uh, data set API which is under the hood this Scala optimization um, you can save the time and uh, you know what's happening right when you use the RDD you, you have to say uh, how to do but here you say what to do you have the freedom, you have the control on the code, and you have the flexibility to change the data. And you can apply any um, function on top of that high, high order. So this is the um, one example uh, we are trying here. So here you have the employee, um, you are trying to join one table. Understand events, I mean employee table is the one RDBMS table, and the events file is the one Parky file. So the first thing we are trying to join on ID, and then we are filtering events date on some uh, date. So what's happening here that events file is a Parquet file, and Parquet is the under the hood uh, optimized for the Spark based on columnar structure. An employee table you are trying to read from the RDBMS, and then you join, and then you apply the filter. But think if you will first filter out the uh, scan when you scan the uh, table and then you filter out and uh, you scan the events and then you will join. You can save the time. But physical plan with predicate push down and column pruning, um, it's, it's always good to uh, first filter out and then uh, uh, join it out. I mean, sometimes when you op when you check the code, Spark job, sometimes you fail. The code is not optimized. FMO is optimized, but you need to align the way uh, transformation like Sun. That, uh, that does uh, help you to in a, in a physical plan and optimize it. So um, when you first filter out any RDBMS table like employees, you are really um, taking less data on the Spark cluster and then you are applying transformation. So it can save a lot of time from you. Data frames are faster than RDD because uh, you see the one of the um, um, chart. 
Ideally, Scala and ideally Python is expensive because, as I said, you need to depickle and pickle before you send to JVM objects. And uh, others are data frame are equal with the whether you use Spark SQL or use the data frame, as I said earlier. So, one more benefit with data set API, it is optimized for casing. So, actually, the uh, engine called uh, tungsten. Tungsten's usage is to generate the code, which I showed earlier. The high level optimized RDD, tungsten is the engine which will create that. And tungsten also help to case data. So as much as you can case the data, okay. Uh, so data set takes less memory to case more data. So it's, it's good for you if you have the less memory and want it to case more data and apply the transformation and the action on top of that. Data sets are faster because uh, the way if you see the uh, JIT uh, engine for J Java works, right? You provide the for loop, then you have the action, and it takes care that with the abstraction on the API that how which order you need to execute. So actually, data sets are inspired from that only in a JVM that. Um, so it takes care about serialization and encoding and decoding instead of you use the curio serializer or java serializer. So encoder is the is a faster way to use data set APIs. Um, before we proceed further on case study, any questions? So I work with uh, 17 TB of data plus uh, around 6.5 billion transactions per day and 17 billion transactions uh, historical data. So what we face the problem and how we uh, fix some of the issues that I'm talking. Uh, before that, if any questions, I would be happy to answer. So, uh, yeah. we, we, we use Spark in production. This is the main part of our product. And in, in a recent project, I, I read the, the book of Holden Karau. The, uh, Holden Karau, the PMC member of Spark, yeah. yeah. So and data sets are, are, are very, very promising. Very promising, and you know, yes. uh, Scala and uh, data set API is compiled time. See, you understand when you run the Spark job, it failed after some time, and you feel some hurt. You know, but it failed. But, but, but the problem is, well, it's not a problem. But when, when we started coding, we realized that it wasn't. So if you go, if you do a little bit more complex operations, the, the whole compile time complex or compile time time checking it is, is going away, even in your code. And when you do the join operation, you have to call the strings. Right? So yeah. we, 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 we save the time. Yeah, yeah, but we, we cannot use the, even though we use the classes, we, we have to go back to strings for, for select operations or other things. So compile time safety is, is gone there. Even though we use data sets. So that, that, that is one of the things that we found found work around to solve it. Yeah, so if you will. But this, this all, the, the, the question is so we have the data model, we have case clusters with their functions in it, with their methods, but when we want to call the functions of, of our methods, uh, we almost always go back to maps in all data sets instead of UDFs. It's, it's probably it, 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 most of the time we cannot optimize the code and we cannot get the full benefits of data sets. Yeah, I mean, from, uh, are you using the Spark 2.3 in production or Spark 2.0? 2.2. 2.2. The Spark 2.3 um, provides you the high level APIs in a person ready. So the benefit, uh, sometimes you get the UDF and then you apply that uh, function on top of the, uh, I mean the data frame. But uh, if you use the higher order function, it supports right now. You uh, you, you provide the map and uh, those and uh, you create the function and pass the function to map and then get the return that. Uh, until you use the UDF, I think uh, that is uh, still not there in 2.2. Um, but if you code the Scala function and then you pass Scala function to the map, that supports okay. that we did. Maybe we can discuss more, more later. Yeah. The, 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 the question maybe I can ask is: Are is writing our own or our, our, our own encoders makes it faster than serialization? So should, should we go that way? Or no, I'm saying that 
data set provides the encoder in 2.3. So you don't have to use the, I mean, sometimes uh, you can say the cardioserializer is equal to true in Spark submit when you, when you say hyperparameters. Uh, but it has by default. Uh, so I'm saying that don't provide the hyperparameter. If you were very familiar with Spark 1.6 and if you are coming with that background, uh, we think it's good because when you see, see, um, it's much more art than science when you work with Spark, right? Uh, you, you know that this hyperparameter is there. And so many hyperparameters. Sometimes uh, I have to take a look on a source code and see what's by default value of the hyperparameter and then check that uh, how it's optimized or not optimized in that way. Cool. So before data, I mean the case study, when you create the architecture of the big data or fast data architecture, so see, uh, I'm talking about fast data. As soon as you get your data, processed data, it makes the value for your customer. It makes the uh, value for your customer because, um, so you have three components, mainly you use data lake, you have data warehouse and streaming message bus. Data lake you use for low cost and massive scale. Let us say edge base. In JSON is very fast. Faster right. Massive scale, you can scale. Let us talk about S3 bucket. In JSON is free, right? And you can scale massively. Data warehouse, like Hive. Uh, faster queries and transaction reliability. So you can scale your uh, KPIs, queries on Hive, which is uh, scaled horizontally on different uh, nodes and cluster. Streaming messaging bus. It's a low latency APIs like Kafka and Kinesis. And still you want to optimize that, you can use the Akka. It's a very high level API, so we use Akka on that. Um, and the, because Akka works on actors. Actor is a very lightweight uh, model, actor model, instead of going through the threads. Um, so when it, become complexity. So you have an application here. And so when you can, when you ingest data with the streaming buses like uh, Kinesis and Kafka, uh, through that, and data ingestion, it goes to the data lake, assume that. You can move any component to anywhere data. And people move, I mean, sometimes people move uh, uh, data from data lake to data warehouse. And then, uh, you, you need aggregation and process data to the, your application on top of that. So it's complex, slow, and ideal process. Unless you apply this, some of the principles of optimization, like uh, if you have, so when you create the Kafka topic and in this to the edge base, and then if you have product managers, if you have the uh, department, those who want to query the data. Now, joining one table of edge base and one table of hive is not performance uh, uh, reactive. Because what will happen, you cannot join. Because HBase is good to read data in, in a form of columns. You cannot you can read data in a form of SQL by using the tools like uh, Drill. But Drill is not that uh, uh, scalable. It's not that optimized to apply. I mean, even we try to join one table of Drill and one table of Hive, it takes a lot of time. So it's, it's not only taking a lot of time, but you are killing the infrastructure because other Spark jobs is not other Spark jobs are on hold for entire cluster. So you have to think about not providing over location of the resources when you tune your job. So I'll talk about retail business, one of the case study. So it's a, it kind of changing the game with re-engineering the data platform. So uh, what business want in a retail? They want who is doing retailing, what is doing retailing, and when, where, and why, and how it's happening, right? That's what business want. We just don't care. You use the Spark, we use whatever you use inside that. So challenges was uh, weekly data refresh and daily data refresh based Spark, Hadoop job execution, failures with unutilized Spark jobs, right? And scalability of, uh, massive data, 4.6 million events per week, plus you will have processing historical data around bulk load, 30 dB of data, and 17 billion transactions, plus uh, linear and sequential execution job mode with broken pipe of data, and joining 17 billion transactional records with a skewed data nature. So what will happen, skewed data nature means 
data is random in theory, uh, so it's not physically fit at some point of time. And you will have to do data deduplication with outlet and item kind of one of the KPIs. The solution we proposed, right, was like, 5x performance on improvement by re-engineering the entire data lake to analytical engine pipelines. Proposed a highly concurrent, elastic, non-locking asynchronous architecture to save customers 22 hours runtime from 30 hours to 8 hours for 6.6 million uh, events. And uh, for historical load, 10x performance you can be achieved using the under the hood optimization, whatever we speak earlier. Same thing I'm talking about here. And that helps in MDM, like master data management. You see duplicate items, duplicate uh, records, duplicate uh, outlets, and for that. So you are curious that how it happened, right? So I'll talk some of the, so you can see here, right, um, how it was. Uh, so most of the customers will have the legacy data at Oracle, RDBMS, so you produce the uh, producer in Kafka, ingest the data, store in HBase data lake, and you will have a process data warehouse at Hive. And then this is kind of earlier, what, what was happening earlier uh, with Apache Spark and Drill, Spark SQL, and get aggregated KPIs here. You might wonder why we have Postgre here, because Hive is not made for microservices. Like You cannot scale microservices, you cannot expose the microservices, because Hive will create the uh, one of the um, hit to the cluster, the text time, and uh, I mean, Postgre also support the way in JSON you can uh, master inside that, and you can expose the APIs. Um, that talks to D3 or Angular, and the QLIP view is the reporting tool for this board. So this is the main, I think, uh, the problem. You have to rethink the data, fast data architecture, where you have to use, when you want to scale, use the data lake. When you want to have a performance and reliability of the data warehouse and the low latency streaming. If you mix out this three component with uh, better combination, with the performance optimization, it helps to create fast data architecture. Uh, let me give you one example. What was happening earlier? People were, I mean, uh, we were executing our workloads on sequential mode. You execute one Spark context, Spark submit, and wait until it get completed. Again, second, again, second, and again. So you, if you understand well data model according to KPIs and business model, you know what you need first. And then you know with that you need to join again. Like outlet and item manufacture and transactions. So obviously this takes more time, right? So what we did, we created this kind of uh, graph. You can, I mean, we use the BMC control M. Uh, you can use the uh, Airflow or kind of different open source tools. So you know those items, outlays, organization, and files are master tables. So you start parallelly executing. So this will utilize your cluster. If you have the good memory and the course and executors, you can utilize the cluster. Plus, so sometimes people, uh, I mean, sometimes third of us do mistake by providing more executors and core and think the workload will uh, will be fast. So as I said earlier, it's art than science. So when you say number of tasks is equal to number of executor into number of core. So each. So what will happen if you have eight executors with eight, eight core each, so you can execute 64 tasks parallelly. So one more thing, the hyperparameter tuning. So you have to enable the external suffer service on the yarn if you are using the source manager. And that will help you to change runtime executors. So what, I mean, is cluster is not for you, right? In your business. Cluster is for high, I mean, if you have the product managers, they use the HQL queries, right? That also runs on Hadoop cluster. And so when you enable the external suffer service, if five jobs are running with Hive, and you execute your fifth Spark job, and those are taking more cores and executors. So if the order of the Spark job is the priority, it will reduce the executors and provide this job. Otherwise, if you run uh, your job having 5 TB of data with around 20 executors and 20 
cos and you provide executor memory and driver memory. So driver is the master node which, which allocate the uh, Spark context and execution. So at that time you are, your job is good allocation to the cluster. Now other jobs cannot start because you are holding the memory and the infrastructure resources. So for that, over allocation of the resources for small jobs. So what people do, as I said earlier, small jobs but you provide more allocation of memory that make hold to the jobs and block entire cluster. So job, so what you can do, those Spark jobs were taking more resources but they were less disk volume intensive and, and hyperparameter executors cause memory on executor driver has been reduced to allow pending jobs to execute and not to block entire cluster. So your job will run a little slowly but utilize the entire cluster with, with the approach that will not hold other Spark jobs. So this is the one of the example you can see here. Um, you provide the um, master is YAM here. Deploy mode is a cluster. Uh, driver memory is 6 gig, executor 12. And you can use the spark.suffer.service.unable true. And you provide spark.dynamic allocation unable true. And uh, that, this will help you to um, allocate resources dynamically on the cluster. And executor memory, you have 30 gig, and executor cores is 10, for example. So number of tasks that runs in parallel is equal to number of executors into cores. So one thing is you can apply two approaches. One approach is like reduce memory and cores and increase the executors. So this will this can allow us to better utilize our resources on the cluster without locking others out. If you reduce the executors and use the same memory that you had, if it is the prep program, this will run slower for that run, but will allow others to use and I mean the cluster box in parallel. So the problem happened like five in an entire team, five people are working, right? If I run my job, other people will complain, like because there is no space remaining on Spark job. This guy is taking entire memory. So first you. Uh, ensure the number, I mean you cannot use same hyperparameter for all jobs. You have to understand the number of records, data size and whether it's disk intensive or the memory intensive. Memory intensive if you're using the persist or case in the uh, casing mechanism in, in a Spark job, based on that you provide that. So this is one of the example, uh, we, uh, I mean we understood whether the count number of and you can utilize and change the exon, what you need to change and everything. One more thing that Spark provides the control and flexibility. Uh, in open source, I mean Spark is open source tool and as you know, it provides the flexibility in the sense you can uh, split the physical data in partitions and you can say that how many number of files you want in that partition. Uh, for example, Spark may produce transformation generate small, small files on larger data set at some extent which lead to increased disk I.O memory I.O, file I.O, and the bandwidth I.O, right? It takes reading, I mean, reading files also take the time. So also downstream high queries and Spark jobs get impact on the performance and sometimes it fails this quota existing, this kind of errors those people can see, container lost, exception, etc. So what happens that you already know the, your dimensions, in fact, you know in your downstream KPIs how you need to do slice and dice. So According to that, you create the partitions and uh, uh, inside partition to partition, and then you can create the you can push data to that. But again, when you push data, it will create the small small files, which impact the performance. So you can use the um, you can use the partitioning. After that, you can apply repartitioning and collapse. So when you talk about repartitioning, it allows you to redistribution of data equally to all partitions, and uh, reduce the number of files and also you can use the callers. Callers will not do uh, suffering, okay? So it is faster than um, repartitioning. One more thing, if you use the repartitioning, you need to bump up your driver memory 
because when you say read distribution will do suffer from driver node, the way broadcast also works. And coalesce will not do suffer, but it will reduce the uh, number of files that you store on in, in a in a partition. Uh, one more thing uh, that this is also one of the good points to understand: don't use uh, streaming everywhere. Uh, it's, it's good to use a frequent batch mode if if you have the if you think your business have at least at least whatever you are doing. Uh, if you're okay with uh, kind of two minutes of SLA, uh, it's, it's okay to use that you know frequent batch mode because streaming will. Uh, will have problems sometimes with partisan hardware failures, GC spike and traffic uh, because um, it, it, it still use the, your, your um, JVM, uh, GC and everything. But data sets uh, also have the fee, I mean the good thing uh, as I told earlier to um, um, encoder, decoder, it use the off hip memory, okay? So your hip memory is off hip. So that is also so kicking off the uh, batch job immediately scale to right size, it needs to be, it does, it works and goes away. You don't, I mean, you don't allocate permanently some of the cluster resources. So this is the one example, uh, historical data processing. So think like, these are the all tables in a hive and partitions. So you understand your data is coming with the POS data when you do transactions, right? So those are the files. Those files you pass it with Kafka and then you dump it to all tables. So outlet by file, item by file, file errors and transaction by file. Every file is a Python file ID, okay? Inside that you will have the data. So when you query by file ID downstream, it will read only that Python. Understood? It is not reading the entire table for you. Now, when we try to join it together, if you see the first thing, uh, those who work with Spark are familiar with this kind of error. This quota existed, executor lost failure, container killed by yarn on existing memory limit side. This is a failure and we wanted to dump all data to Redshift, okay? So we only want transitions related to error here that that's failed. So alternate approach that after doing some of the R&D that we got was create temporary view here and insert all data to Hive internal table. So the, there's two things, external table and internal table in Hive. So external table when you delete it, so the internal table when you delete it will delete the table structure, meta store and the data. So when you delete the external table, it will delete the all structure or the data. So we dumped out to the internal table here, manage table and parquet format, format without non partition data. So you read everything, join it and dump down to the hive. So when, when you wanted to uh, dump data to Redshift, uh, we did enable the yarn external support service, enable uh, dynamic resource allocation and tune hyperparameters to utilize cluster, apply business transmission here, okay? So whatever you apply business transmission, apply here. Just get data to the one table, okay? And then move bulk load to the red shift or somewhere else, okay? So you can see here one TB of output data suffer was happening here. And you can see all executor are utilized on the cluster. Sometime when you open the Spark UI, you can see some of them are, are red or purple here. So executor, executor is lost. But Spark provides the, as I told earlier, dynamic uh, uh, DAG. So that graph will get created again. So how is a Nebula using, I mean, how it was possible because of the open source Spark and the Scala optimization? And uh, see, everything is open source, right? So if you fill the other tools like Informatica Power Center, ETL tools, where you don't have flexibility and control. You don't know how under the hood optimization is happening, how data is physically splitted, where, what you need to apply. And the, you understand your business logic and transformation queries. According to that, you create the your transformation and partition, and you can uh, control the number of files on that. 
Yeah, so that's it. Any question? Hi. Uh, you speak about your password. Is it uh, Hadoop password on premise or is it a cloud? It's on premises. Okay. Yeah. Have you worked with uh, AMR password? Uh, AWS EMR, um, yeah, you submit your Spark job to AMR and it will take care. But mostly, um, the issue is like that when you use EMR, what happens, uh, because you need to do uh, in and out, uh, you need to apply some of the R&D that is working or not, it costs you the, at the end of billing, right? That uh, the time you allocate resources in that. So uh, on-premise is flexible, it's like uh, you don't have to pay. As I said earlier, uh, if your job runs for eight hours and it failed, you again need to tune it, right? And distribute it in nature. So, um, My question is, suppose I have a data in S3, it's partitioning very well, uh, but when I run uh, MR cluster, so when it reads uh, data from S3, so I should uh, transfer data to MR cluster. It will be the same partitioning, or what happens with the data? EMR? Yes. So, you can control from the Spark job. So EMR is just taking the your Spark job jar, right? So your jar file, when you build a bundle jar, you pass to the EMR, that will uh, be taken care of under the hood. I assume that AWS also use the um, Spark, uh, open source Spark, so that, that has that control. So you can achieve whatever I said in EMR. There's nothing that you can't do with EMR. Or Google has the data proc on the cloud, uh, which is a kind of similar service from Amazon and Google. Anyone? Okay, thank you. You can tweet me if you have any questions later or anytime. Um,